Chapter 9. The Moral of the Story I'm the one who should be mobbed by strangers wherever I go. Clouds When I first stepped outside into this new world, the world was impossibly big. The sky terrifyingly high. Now, the omnipresent clouds, shifting, boiling, and darkening with rain, were just another ceiling. Gray, like the one in stable maintenance. Only rarely, like on that first night, would a small fissure open in the clouds, like a gaping wound that would slowly heal. The tantalizing glimpse of a bright, wondrous blue above, cheerful and serene, tempting and tortured those living in the gloom below. Little Pip, Velvet asked, her own thoughts not far from my own. Does the air seem strange to you outside? The day is so warm and bright, and yet the air is sickly. I feel so eager and yet hesitant to be enwrapped by it. Like it's poisonous, I agreed. Calamity said nothing. I suppose that the air to him was the air that it had always been, and it had always been like this. The strewn wreckage of Pegasus' vehicles, cast from the sky when the metropolis city of Cloudsdale was obliterated in a single hoof stomp, stretched on for miles. Some of the sky chariots and wagons were marred further from the old skeletons of the poor ponies who were struck dead or mortally wounded by the megaspell. But those bodies were not wiped from existence entirely. The mountains rose up to either side of the valley. Sickly grass forested the blackened trees. New plants grew around them, feeding on their corpses. Up and ahead was the worn and faded image of a giant sparkle cola bottle, the stylized carrot immediately identifying the drink, even though the words on the sign had faded into severely, too severely to read. A badly faded yellow pony with a pink mane was holding it aloft in an in nearly orgasmic glee. According to Calamity, these giant signs, called billboards, had once littered every major sky route between Cloudsdale and other cities, advertising goods and services from all over Equestria. I could recognize the familiar image of the heroic ponies, with rainbows exploding across the sky behind them as they swooped over the armies of wicked zebras. Better whipped than stripped. A large, enclosed delivery wagon lay battered, bent, and sunken, partially into the ground. I spotted it on its side what appeared to be a business logo. A pattern of seven ascending circles, which struck me as strangely familiar. I didn't have to ponder it long, as before we drew closer, my Pipbuck auto mapped, christened it, Wreckage of Ditsy Doo Deliveries. Now I remembered where I'd seen the pattern before, on the interior title page of the Wasteland Survival Guide. Calamity was looking at the wreckage with similar comprehension, but Velvet looked between us, confused at why we had stopped to stare. What? This is where Ditsy Doo fell, I said, feeling awe and intense sadness. This... this would have been her only grave marker had she not suffered a stranger fate. Who? Did he do? I repeated, lost in my own thoughts. I was trying to imagine what it had been like. Velvet, who did not know the name, gave me an ex identically confused look, just how helpful she felt that answer was, and turned to Calamity. Yep. Velvet nickered and walked past, circling around the back. Moments later, I heard her call out. Little Pip, would you please come look at this? Her voice had a tone of hope. I trotted around to find her, not at all like a little puppy at her owner's call. Boxes and crates littered the ground 
around the back of Ditsy Doo Delivery's wagon. And many more were toppled and crashed inside. Some had been torn open, and all had been looted for anything of value. Except that was, for a safe and a foot locker in the back. It was a ladder which had donned Velvet's extreme excitement, because, while identical in make to every other foot locker that run across, the markings were very distinct. Three bands of yellow, and the center one with a pink butterfly emblem. This was not a medical box, but the colors and symbols were clearly those of the Ministry of Peace. Sure, no problem, I announced proudly floating out my screwdriver and bobby pin as I watched Velvet struggling not to prance in anticipation. Turning away, I started on the picking the lock of the safe first. I could hear her stomp her hoof and bit my lower lip to stifle a laugh. The safe's lock gave up almost too easily. Considering the level of looting, I was surprised that such a weak lock had been a long-lived deterrent. Was I the only one on the outside who had developed the skill? I opened the safe. One item inside immediately captured my attention. The entire interior of the safe was filled with a rosy glow emanating from the bottle of luminescent purplish red liquid. Sparkle Cola, rad, with an invigorating touch of radiation and a blast of radish flavoring. It's like a buck to the face with radishes. The Sparkle Cola rad flowed out of the safe past me, enveloped in the glow of a magical glow by Velvet's horn. Raising the bottle to eye level, she winced at it with a despairing gaze. That's insane. How could any pony be so stupid as to think consuming radiation is healthy? My own levitation abilities had been so out overstrained that it actually took effort to snatch the bottle back. But I proudly kept myself from panting. Velvet Remedy stared in something approaching horror as she saw me sip the bottle into my saddlebags. You're not actually intending to drink that, are you? I shrugged. It did sound like it would be tasty, and according to my pit buck, the radiation still presented was minor enough to be washed away with Rataway right potion later. I turned to the footlocker, prompting Velvet to forget, or at least ignore, the beverage in my saddlebags. This lock was not easy. It selfishly refused to give up its secrets. After the third try, I began to worry that this one was beyond me. And I desperately didn't want Velvet Remedy to see me fail. I had one other option. But I didn't want her to see that either. This is a tough one. I, I'm going to need concentration. Velvet, could you uh, step out, please? I could tell she didn't want to, but with Lady Light Grace, she departed. As soon as she went out of sight, I brought up my pit buck's sorting spell and pulled out the tin of mintals out from where I had hidden them at the bottom of my pack. This wasn't the incredible party time treat I had last time, but I didn't need to talk to the locker. Opening the tin, I popped one in my mouth and began to chew. The effect was immediate. It was like a gray film was being washed away from all my senses, like my mind was clearing after having been in a deep fog. I was more alive and aware than ever before. This was not party time, and definitely not as candylicious, but it was enough to make the damn locks sing for me. Outside, I could hear Velvet Remedy's voice. Calamity, may I ask you something? Yep, I reckon you can. Why is it that you are the only Pegasus Pony I've seen in the Equestrian Wasteland? I was under the impression that Pegasus Ponies should be as common as Earth and Unicorn Ponies. My ears perked. Their conversation wasn't meant to be private. So this wasn't eavesdropping exactly. And I had to admit, I wanted to know that too. There was a pregnant pause, and then Calamity nickered. Wow, lady, when you ask a question, you go right for the throat, don't you? I'm sorry, I apologize if this is personal. 
No, no. Yeah. You should know, I guess. I could hear Calamity sigh. My perceptiveness was heightened to an amazing degree. As I had predicted, the lock was now easy and clicked open in surrender. You ain't gonna find any other Pegasus ponies. Not unless they're like me. He paused, as if speaking about it was physically taxing. You see, back during the war, we Pegasus ponies were Equestria's greatest fighting force. We were the elites. The best of the best. But after Cloudsdale was hit, well, that was game over. They abandoned the war. Abandoned Equestria. Although, it's not like either one of them lasted more than a few hours past that anyway. The Pegasus ponies closed up the sky and went into hiding. Closed up the sky? Yep. They kicked the cloud makers up to full power and locked them like that, saving their other cities, their families. The zebras couldn't well target what they couldn't see, now that they didn't try. Got a few lucky hits, but not many. I could hear one of them dig a hoof into the ground. Ain't been a day I haven't been at least mostly cloudy in Equestria ever since. Velvet Remedy gasped. That's... That's horrible. Oh. They keep telling themselves that any day now, they'll turn them off. Open the sky. Come swooping down to save the rest of you. When they're ready. When the time is right. Calamity nickered in clear contempt. Been telling themselves that for upwards of 200 years now. Truth is, they're still too arrogant and lazy to bother. So long as they can keep telling themselves that they'll do the right thing eventually, they can live with themselves. Meanwhile, the otter, all dying down here and from slavers and raiders and monsters, and you're making a damn hard effort to save yourselves without their help. It sounded more to me like the Pegasus ponies were scared. I opened the hoof locker and stared, looking through the items inside. And you? Velvet asked. I didn't find the living with myself so easily, as that lot seemed to. Bunch of winged horse apples. Wow, Calamity. So very glad to have you on our side. But bitter much? A few moments later, Velvet trotted to the back of the delivery wagon. She spared a glance back in Calamity's direction. They noticed I'd opened the footlocker. With a pleased sound, she virtually danced over to the debris to reach me. Inside, there were numerous scrolls, ruined when the bottle of something had shattered, and the glass shards of said bottle, a framed picture of a bunny rabbit, a small crystal orb sealed in a clear bag, property of the Ministry of Peace, restricted viewing only, unauthorized viewers will be prosecuted, and a book, Supernaturals. Oh! Velvet gasped, and made a sound that I felt I could fairly describe as a squee. I watched her, the corners of my mouth twitching upwards as I realized that Velvet Remedy, the amazing unicorn of unparalleled beauty and musical grace, who had inspired at least 300 fans, was herself more than a bit of a fan filly. I know what this is! Velvet announced, floating the bag with the orb up for closer inspection. It's a memory orb, used to record events not only with sound, but moving picture. Much better than a recorder or a camera. Rare, too. Velvet collected the memory orb and the bunny photo. I was surprised when she left the book. Oh, I already have that one. You should take it, little Pip. I know you'll find it useful. Something in her expression made me think that there was a joke here and at my expense. Still, I wasn't one to turn down a book, especially if it was one of Velvet Remedy's suggestion. I had just finished sliding the book into my saddlebags, when my eyes-forward sparkle compass exploded with red. I froze. Crap. That's a lot of enemies. In my mind, I knew the slavers had found us again, and from the looks of things, 
They had brought an army. Little Pip? What is it? Anxious, I whispered. Go get Calamity. Quietly. Please. I turned slowly in pace. There were gaps in the red. We weren't entirely surrounded. Trouble. More than I could handle. Velvet immediately tensed, nodding nervously, and trotted back as quickly as she could, only knocking over one crate along the way. We both winced. As she reached the back end of the wagon, she stopped aghast. Zombie ponies! What? Not slavers? I moved up next to her. I was already forming how I was going to explain to her about the ghouls, but the words died on my lips as I looked in the blank, hungry stares and shambling, grotesque movements of the approaching herd. These did not look like ghouls. These looked like zombie ponies. I remembered the warning. You get into the wrong places. You find yourself hunted by whole packs of cannibal ghoul ponies gone zombie. Moving closer to Calamity, I whispered, Follow me. We watched them shuffle a foot nearer, too, and the closest zombie pony broke into a savage charge. Run! We ran. Ran like we were being chased by a mindless horde of monsters intent on eating us alive. Because we were. The zombie ponies exploded into action, joining the hunt. Our fret flesh the prize they were after. Many launched into the air and flew towards us. I tried to tele telekinetically grab a downed sky chariot as we raced past it, but the glory on my horn sparkled and died. I had no telekinetic tricks to save us. Velvet Remedy shrieked as a zombie pony dove from the sky. She ducked, and the creature overshot her and crashed into a tree. I leapt over the body and kept going, my side beginning to hurt. That hurt swiftly grew into a burning coals in my side, bringing tears to my eyes, threatening to sap my strength. Two more zombie ponies dived towards us. Calamity, wide-eyed in fear, slowly scowled and spat out, Ah, screw this. He skidded to a halt, reared around, and opened fire. The shot ripped the featherless wings off one of the zombies, causing it to lurch into the other, and the two tumbled out of the sky in a spin, crashing goryly into the half-buried metal skeleton of a huge wagon designed to carry smaller wagons. Ahead, the rusted bulk of a long passenger chariot rose out of the ground like a barricade. Launching himself into the air, Clemity yelled for us to go around it and keep running. Don't slow down, not for an instant, he cried as he dodged another flying zombie pony, kicking his saddle to reload. Velvet was pulling while ahead of me, and my shorter legs were burning as my side threatened to spell out a most horrific death for me. Velvet tore around the side of the passenger wagon and disappeared behind it. I could hear the herd rattle my tail, hooves thundering over the ground as a hungry stampede, foul breath hitting my mane. I couldn't make the turn. They'd be on me if I tried, hoping that my small size would come to my aid for once. Instead, I leapt for one of the shattered, gaping windows. My body, saddlebags and all, sailed through the cleanly opened window, and I hit one of the benches inside and jumped for the opposite window without breaking speed. Jagged sarge of glass cut at my neck and legs, slashing against my armor before snapping away as my saddlebags hit them. I was out again and almost clear, when the strap of my sniper rifle caught on a piece of jagged metal, and I was jerked to a halt, swinging back into the wagon side with a jarring thud. I was caught. I tried to pull away, but my hooves barely brushed the ground. I could hear the hoofbeats of the magnitude of ponies, zombie ponies as they reached the long body of the wagon. I heard splitting to go on either side. I twisted around, trying to bright, bite the strap loose before they were on top of me. Somewhere above, I heard Calamity taking shots. I heard the metal of the wagon dent and puncture, 
his hits, for once, not striking the enemy. Panic flared through me. If the zombie ponies didn't scare me, one of Calamity's wild shots might. Terribly, I realized how preferable a fate like that would be, and I prayed to Celestia that Celestia would grant him the wisdom and mercy to shoot me if they started to eat me. With a final strong bite, the snap strap broke, and I fell free. Instinctively, I grasped the sniper rifle in my teeth, realizing only later how foolish a waste of precious second that would be, and ran as hard as my screaming legs inside would take me. The zombie herd was almost coming around the passenger wagon and closing in on me. Their hooves brutalized the discovered gra discolored grass beneath. Even more swooped over it with an ease that made my shortcut laughable. My clear mind and heightened perceptions had become a horror. I could feel the ground tremble beneath me, and I could calculate how swiftly they would be gnawing on my hide. I could make it out a strange faint popping, even through the rumble of the herd. I could feel myself lifted into the air as the wreckage of the passenger wagon was consumed in a flare of unleashed wild magic. I could see the pulsating cascade of colors cast strange shadows as swirling magical energies erupted through the air, and I could smell the fetid corpse stench of the zombies as they were blown apart, even as their body parts caught fire. I hit the ground, still running, in the valley lurching about as I fought to keep from tumbling. Bits of zombie pony splattered down on me like rain, and ahead of me, Bubba Remedy had stopped and was just staring, her eyes fixed on the scene behind me. I preferred not to imagine. Most of the herd was killed in the blast. Many, who were not shattered, but not for long. Calamity swooped over me, crying out for a panting velvet to turn back around and keep running. A cluster of odd sky vehicles, painted a motley light blue and gray with tiny splashes of white, formed the only possible defensible position. Beyond that, the valley spread out into a rolling, rocky hills that offered no cover. We reached it, as more zombie ponies flew over us, landing just yards away. Velvet Remedy lowered her horn, charging at them, and skewered one messily. Unable to hold back an EW that I emphasized with completely. I tried to grasp little Macintosh telekinetically, but my magic just couldn't, and desperately I looked around for something I could grasp in my mouth. A piece of sufficiently spear-like debris would do. What I found was infinitely better. At least, I thought so. As Calamity shot the zombie pony moving towards me, I scrambled over to where the cargo of one of the vehicles had spilt. I had seen, in small and crude glimpses, a beautiful light blue sky above the clouds. My menthol clear mind quickly realized the paint on those strange sky chariots would have once served as camouflage a Pegasus military convoy, and pray Celestia, one of the things I might have been transporting was a turret. I was trained to reprogram the spell matrix of a pit buck. Tweaking a turret to run off my pit buck definitions of friend and foe was comparatively easy, especially right now. Uh, little Pip, you sure you know what you're doing? Clamity asked sparing me a glance as he landed between me and more zombie ponies, firing again. I was all grins. You betcha! Celestia, watch you and keep you safe as you travel down the path you choose. May Luna be with you and keep you strong, so your courage you may never lose. Remain loyal, honest, and brave. Forget not the ones that you save, and in our hearts you will do no wrong. Velvet Remedy's tune wove between humming and lyrics, the latter in a state of constant flux. For me, watching my idol actually crafting a song was amazing. 
Calamity didn't complain. He too found her music to be uplifting in the bleakness of the wasteland. Although this occasional eye rolling suggested he wished for she would stick with just one set of lyrics rather than seeking perfection. It had been several hours since the zombies of the valley and the valley were safely behind us. A darker gray had began to seep into the sky again. Not a storm, Calamity said, with some encouragement. Just the approach of nightfall. If I had ever met the Pegasus ponies, I thought, I'll have to thank them for making the equestrian wasteland so depressing. Somehow, it was worse than the drab monotry of Stable 2. Monotony of Stable 2. Because I never believed the stable could be better. Although, that could have been the post menthol depression talking. Oh my! Velvet gasped as we crested the rolling hill and saw it. An absolutely gigantic billboard, far taller than any of the buildings I'd seen, loomed just beyond the hill. The image, amazingly unfaded, yet marred with the grime and water damage of centuries, was nothing but the giant face of an almost unbearably pink pony with a mane that aged had turned into a candy cane. She was smiling. Her eyes seemed to follow us. I'd seen this before from the train, even now recognizable in this light at the distance of the billboard. It, merciful Celestia, still gave me nervous chills. I stared as I walked closer, trying to imagine it before so many decades had taken their toll, before it had been repeatedly peppered by wind-blown dust and ash, streaked by rivulets of rain, back when its placement would have been able to be perfectly playful, set behind the pr rise of hills so that it looked like the pony was playing peekaboo with the whole damn countryside. Back when it was so... Luna, damn it. Fucking creepy. I tried to shake off the feeling with a shudder. Turning away from the massive billboard, I found myself staring at a sneaky sprite bot. Hello, little pip. I would have been in the next country if Calamity didn't bite my fleeing tail. He held me while I ran in place until the panic left me. By that time, Roger had wisely floated out of Hoof's reach. You are so lucky I can't telekinetically hurl rocks at you right now. Velvet Remedy looked like she'd helped me. Calamity was glaring distrustfully at the spry spot. Wings out. Legs spread like a defensive stance. Lil Pip. All I wanted to know at the moment was... Watcher, are they safe? The sprite bot bobbed. Yes, wagons are on their way. Although, Ditsy Doo might now be under the impression that you can hack sprite bots and send messages through them. Sorry about that. Little Pip? Clemmy would have been growling if he could. I don't trust that thing. So, Watcher had found a way to relay a message without alerting the pony folk of New Appaloosa to what Watcher was able to do. At Calamity's words, I realized I really didn't trust Watcher either. And now that I knew the ponies we fought and nearly died to rescue were safe, or soon would be, quite a few questions tumbled in my mind. First and foremost, you sent me into a raider pit, knowing full well what and who I would find there, didn't you? Clemity broke off, staring at the strangely behaving sprite box, looking to me. I never told him why I had gone to Ponyville Library. They needed help. You could have told me the truth. Hey, I didn't exactly know you, now did I? You seemed like a good pony, who'd be the right who would do the right thing once you saw it for yourself, but now I felt like growling. You lied to me. No! If it was possible for the toneless mechanical voice to sound heated, it would have. I told you that it didn't mean you harm, and I didn't. I told you that you would find something you needed to survive in there. The sprite bot flew close, and I'd say you found more valuable things in there than just a book. 
Wouldn't you agree? Damn it. Watcher was right. I found Ditsy Doo, who was an acquaintance I valued far more than the guide she wrote, which I held in fairly high regard. Spinning a mental web, I could make an argument that my friendship with Calamity arose out of what happened there. Possibly, although less firmly, I could save my relationship with the new Appaloosians, and thus my ability to save many more ponies, including the remedy, for certain definitions of saving, stemmed from what Red Watcher pulled. I still wanted to stuff a hoof through the damn spite bot's front plate, but I knew that wouldn't do any good. The sprite bot wasn't Watcher. Velvet Remedy spoke up. Little Pip, what's going on here? I told them everything. Whoops, almost about that time. Watcher warned as I finished up my tale. Watcher only rarely commenting. Calamity was still giving the nasty bot nasty looks. I grinned at the questions in my head, prioritizing. Watcher, you seem to know a lot about things. Well, yeah. What were the ministries? I had seen enough references to ministries scattered in artifacts of the past that I suspected such information would be helpful for context. I didn't realize that I had just asked was arguably the most important question of my life. Or it was, at least, Celestia tier. Watcher was silent for a while. Long enough that I thought our strange pseudo-companion might have winked out again. Watcher's worms came slow and deliberate. Remember when I told you that you should search for your virtue? And I told you about the greatest heroes of Equestria. I nodded. You mentioned them. Yes. Well, Watcher's word came more slowly, as if they were painful. The massacre at Littlehorn broke Princess Celestia's heart. After that, nearly midway through the war, Princess Celestia decided she wasn't the right pony to lead Equestria anymore. So she stepped down, abdicating her position to her sister, Princess Luna. I listened in awe. I had never heard the goddesses spoken about in this way before. The war had been devastating, both abroad and at home. Equestria was in severe distress, suffering from troubles within as well as from enemy armies. You can't imagine what it was like back then. Those heroes I told you about? They were six amazing ponies with true hearts and virtuous souls whose friendship held the power to change the world. Princess Celestia had always been like a mother to them. She saw them, one in particular, as her children. She loved them and wanted to protect them. So Princess Celestia shielded them from the worst of the war, finding quests for them that kept them mostly out of harm's reach, or at least away from the battlefields, sending them on diplomatic missions to the Griffins and to the Buffalo, Things like that. Princess Luna met them for the first time in a much different circumstance. Princess Luna respected them and saw them as her equals. And, I really think, as her saviors. And so, when Princess Luna ascended to rule Equestria and fight the war, she called Equestria's most valuable heroes to serve as her personal advisors. She called for the creation of new offices of government, one under each of them, whose job would be to take their advice and find ways to implement it. And those were the ministries? Yes. I looked around at the bleak, ruined wasteland that had once been the beautiful nation of Equestria. It doesn't look like me, to me like it went so well. Silence. Then Watcher spoke again. Have you ever heard the old saying, the portal to hell is opened with the incantation of good intentions? If there was a moral to the story, I guess that would be it. As night closed in, we approached a farm that seemed largely intact. No animals in the fields, but smoke curled up from the smokestack, and there was a welcoming glow in several of the windows. 
as well as light, light seeping through the cracks around the silo doors. It was just the three of us again. The watcher had vanished with a pop, replaced by tiny patriotic music and an obvious sprite bot. Clemity had kept the wary eye on the bot until it had wandered out of sight. A raven fluttered down and perched on the first of what looked like a small row of three planks, sticking out of the ground near the edge of the barren pasture. The last plank was smaller and crooked. The last fellow was standing of a fence, I presumed. Quickly, but carefully, we trotted down the rocky hillside and through the stone-strewn fields to reach the house. We needed a place to sleep, food to eat, and if possible, medical supplies. The house seemed like it was sent from Celestia herself, assuming the ponies inside didn't shoot us for trespassing. Hanging hope on the hospitality of strangers was unwise in the equestrian wasteland. A creaky windmill with two-thirds of its blades missing squeaked rustily as we passed. Maybe this isn't such a good idea, I began. Just because there was no awful graffiti didn't mean that the place wasn't full of raiders. Little Remedy marched past me. Really, little Pip, you shouldn't sound so jaded, she said, raising a hoof to knock on the door when it swung open, bathing us in warm light. Velvet blinked at the empty space in front of her, then looked down to see the filly in the doorway. She was pink, garnishingly pink. It was oddly like sh looking straight at the face of the giant billboard, only much, much, much smaller and younger, and a very imperfect match. It was hard to tell in the light, but she seemed wrong somehow. My eyes first lighted on the rough scar on her head, like she'd recently fallen head first, possibly at a very high speed and scraped herself up rather badly. The first guess that popped in my head was that she had jumped off the roof of her barn, trying to fly. My eyes moved to her sides, looking for wings, but she was indeed an earth pony. Then my eyes caught her bare flank. She was young, but not that young. She stood less than a head shorter than me, and I knew what it was like to strive for a cutie mark that wouldn't come. My heart went out to her. She had waited longer for hers than even I had, and was still had to wait. No. Wait. The wrongness snapped into focus. If I'd been on menthols, I would have realized it immediately. Her coat wasn't actually her coat. She'd painted herself pink. I looked at Calamity and Velvet Remedy. From their expressions, they'd seen it too. And it didn't sit well with them. Hello, dear, Velvet began. Is your mother... Oh my gosh! The filly jumped, squealing in delight. Then, just as quickly, she brought a hoof to her mouth, gasping as if in horror. Oh no, you're too late. I waited for you all day, but now we're closed. Tears welled up in her eyes. Velvet Remedy took a step back. Oh dear, I'm sorry, young one, but we're not... The look of horror dissipated instantly, replaced with a wide grin. Of course you're not, as if we're ever close. She giggled exuberantly. She ran out of the house, dashing past us, then spun with a suddenly somber expression. You really should hurry, though. Nasty things sunk these fields at night. With that ominous proclamation, she squealed with glee and ran towards the silo. We looked at each other. I was confused. Calamity simply shrugged and started trotting after the young, pink girl. As we reached the silo, Velvet called out. I'm sorry, sweetie, but we didn't get your name. Oh! The pink filly jumped. <laughs> Of course. Sorry, I'm just so excited. You're the first visitors I've had to the museum in... Oh, gosh. Uh, ages. 
giggling again. Oh, I'm Pinky Bell. Museum? I raised an eyebrow. Pinky Bell pranced herself, braced herself, and pushed open the silo door. The inside of the silo looked like a party had exploded inside of it. Not in a good way. More like a party had ingested a grenade, and the room was now splattered with party gore and party entrails. Welcome to the Pinkie Pie Museum! The girl was practically bouncing. This here is the number one museum of all things Pinkie Pie in Equestria. Calamity was shaking his head, but there was a relieved smile on his face. Velvet Remedy gave Calamity a smirk, and he rolled his eyes in return. This was weird, no doubt about it. But, no slaver, no raiders, no horrible monsters. A descent into the slightly bizarre was almost a welcome change. Pinky Bell didn't let up. Didn't even stop for, for breath. And, what do you know? You're just in time for the tour! Now, where's our tour guide? She better not be sleeping again. <laughs> oh wait, it's me! The museum was a single huge room. There wasn't much to tour. The pink... But Pinky Bell made it a point to stop and show off one item after another. Most of them adorned with saggy balloons or vomited all over with confetti. And they danced and danced all day and all night. And best of all, this is the very silo where Pinkie Pie, as a young filly, invented the first ever party and got her cutie mark. Velvet leaned close to me, murmuring. I'm fairly certain that parties have existed for more than 250 years. But Pinky Bell was clearly on a roll, not about to stop for questions. During the first years of the war, Pinkie Pie traveled all over, throwing parties for equestrian troops, about to head into battle, bringing them a taste of their homeland, and more importantly, bringing them cheer and putting smiles on their faces. Pinkie Bell waved her arms at several easels with framed photographs of Pinkie Pie, dressed in frills and fishnets, dancing on stage in front of nearly a thousand ponies. That is, when she wasn't on super secret missions for Princess Celestia. She looks a lot smaller in person, I commented back to Velvet, thinking of how much less threatening the real pony seemed than the insane billboard just a few miles from this barn. Pinkie Pie's only regret was that she couldn't be everywhere helping all the troops at the same time. Although, with Dash, she could pretty much come close. So of course, Calamity raised a hoof. Dash? Her friend Dash? Or Dash the drug? Pinkie Bell seemed not to notice. Prancing towards the familiar poster, Pinkie Bell rambled on, unstoppable. When Princess Luna offered to give Pinkie Pie a whole ministry of her own to do whatever she wanted with, she pronounced, she pronounced, she pounced on the chance, and the Ministry of Morale was born. It was the Pinkie Pie is Watching You Forever poster, this one intact. The elderly pink mare was smiling mischievously, as if she'd just played a wonderful prank. And with the whole face visible, I swore I caught a curious look in her eye. I no longer felt guilty with the poster staring at me. Now, I felt uncomfortably exposed. A practiced twirl took Pinkie Bell to a table covered in a chemistry set and several samples. Pinkie Pie was always really great at cooking things, and when Princess Luna, boo, declared that the drugs that were floating, flooding Equestria from Zebraland were harmful to people, Pinkie Pie decided to prove that they could be good and fun addition to any party. Working day and night, Pinkie Pie concocted a mixture of mintals and some of her flavoring things called Dun 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 Party Time Mintals. Pinkie Bell lifted up a tin, showing them off. I wanted that tin. Pinkie Bell set it down next to the chemistry set and continued on. I lost track of her monologue because my mind insisted that I needed to be absolutely sure I remembered where that tin was. 
By the time the Ministry of Morale had transformed Pinkie Pie into an almost iconic figure, who transcended the boundaries of One Pony to become a mythical figure that easily stood alongside Princess Celestia and Princess Luna themselves. Okay, that was just wrong. Little Colts and Philly knew that Pinkie Pie was always watching them. She saw everything that they did, and if they were good little Phillies and Colts, who were nice and friendly, and who did their chores and smiled and laughed, and never spread susceptious lies, then on their birthdays, Pinkie Pie would bring them a wonderful party. Pinkie Bell waved a hoof in warning. But if they were bad little Colts and Phillies, Pinkie Pie would bring them a rock. What the? I looked to Velvet Remedy in disbelief. Meanwhile, Pinkie Bell had stopped. Her eyes went wide, and she sucked in a huge breath and waited. One second. Two. Three. Four. Finally, Pinkie Bell let out a breath with a disappointed sigh. I'm sorry. I thought I felt an impromptu musical number coming on. Velvet Remedy studiously looked elsewhere. Anyway, what I was what was I saying? Oh yeah, how Pinkie Pie brings parties. Velvet Remedy turned to the little filly and started. Brings? Dear, do you know that Pinkie Pie is dead, don't you? Pinkie Bell did miss a beat. Oh, she's physically dead, but her spirit lives on inside all of us. I watched Velvet Remedy's eyes raise. Eyebrows raise. And then she snickered, seeming to accept that on the level, I just couldn't. While I faced hoofed, Velvet leaned in close to Calamity and whispered, I think Pinkie Pie's spirit has a stalker. I managed to miss most of the rest of the tour, because I was trying to come up with a way to talk Pinkie Bell into partying, into partying with that it was probably the prize of her collection. But I was snapped back when Pinkie Bell announced that she had something to ask of us. A proposal. It turns out, I only have... I have the only copy of the recipe for Party Time Mintals. Okay, I knew that wasn't true. Calamity's friend also had it. But, this might be the fastest, easiest way to get it for myself. And why stress over asking for a single tin when I can get the damn recipe? And, I'd be willing to share it with you if you can bring me one piece for my Pinkie Pie Museum that I'm missing. A limited edition Pinkie Pie Magical Statuette. Bring it here, and I'll throw the party to end all parties. I shouldn't have made fun, Velvet Remedy was saying as she trotted nervously about the cramped upstairs bedroom that Pinkie Bell had absolutely insisted we stay in for the night. When Pinkie Bell explained that a few sets of very special magical figurines had been crafted for each of the Ministry Mayors, my mind had immediately gone to the orange pony statuette with the three apples on her flank. Finding another one like that, one specifically for Pinkie Pie, could be virtually impossible. On the other hoof, Pinkie Bell insisted that the statuettes would have survived even the apocalypse. And really, I found one after being outside for roughly what, a week? Calamity sat on the bed, one ear to the wall as he watched Velvet fret. That poor filly. So, she's so terribly sad. Calamity whined. Sad? Were you listening to the same little pink painted ball of dash that I was? Then remembering his own earlier confusion, he clarified. The drug. Velvet Remedy stopped. Oh, yes. And that poor girl is not happy. Not at all. She hung her head. She's full of pain. Something horrible must have happened to her. Looking at Velvet Remedy, I was once more struck by the scarlet and gold stripes in her silvery white mane, again finding them oddly reminiscent of the Ministry of Peace's pink and yellow. Only then was I thinking of it as a coincidence or destiny. Now I wondered if it wasn't more like Pinkie Bell's painted on pink coat. Velvet caught my stare and seemed to fathom what I was thinking eerily quickly. It's not the same, she insisted quietly. Clement was paying more attention to the wall. Abruptly, he jumped to his hooves. She's gone. And if you don't want something horrible to happen to us, I suggest we be leaving too. 
I moved to the door and pushed on the handle. It didn't budge. It was locked. Maybe she's trying to keep us safe from nasty things that haunt the fields at night. I offered, but not really believing it. Velvet Remedy had pushed past me to the door itself. Now she whined. Doesn't matter. We're leaving. I will not be locked in the cage. Remedy had moved to the glass, to the window. I was looking down at the farm below. I reared up, putting my hooves on the ledge, and peered through the glass. For a moment, I saw nothing but the night. Then, a crack of dimly pulsing colored light appeared as Pinky Bell pushed open the door of the barn, just enough to slide through, and then pushed it shut behind her. Clemity waited, quietly and still, until the door of the farmhouse opened, casting a rectangle of light across the ground with a Pinky Bell shape cut into it. The moment the door closed, he turned and bucked at the window. The crash was terribly loud. The escape would have been treacherous, if not impossible, without a Pegasus pony to fly us down. We stepped across the farm, crouching low, keeping to the deeper shadows of the darkness. We were creeping alongside the barn when impulse overtook me and I slipped inside. I later told Velvet Remedy and Calamity that I wasn't sure why I entered the barn, but the truth is, I had exactly two reasons. First, the recipe for party time mintals had not been in the museum, and I had not spotted it in the house. I could just have easily been hidden anywhere, in a book, under a rug, but I was guessing that Pinky Bell's obsession would not allow her to put it on display, so I was hoping it was in the barn. Second, that oddly glowing, pulsating light reminded me uncomfortably of the way the passenger wagon had exploded after Calamity shot it. I had asked Calamity about it earlier, and he had explained that some of the really big sky wagons, like the one which had been designed to carry dozens of ponies, used a magical field generated by a spark engine so that a single pony could pull it through the air. Like spark batteries, those engines of arcane science still hold serious magical energies. Clement didn't understand it at that level, of course. He just knew that shooting a hole through the magical box of one of those vehicles unleashed one hell of a vortex. Such a vortex was brief and violent. The idea that Pinky Bell might have something akin to that in her barn, possibly a somehow stable or perpetual magical vortex, deeply worried me. What am I looking at? It was small, geometrically, geometrically shaped, with surfaces that seemed to twist through each other. The whole thing was the size of a bushel of apples, and swirled with sickeningly mesmerizing colors. I could feel it drawing me in. I was losing myself in it. It took physical effort to pull myself away from the thing. Casting my gaze about, I found a safe. The rest of the barn was almost completely barren. I slipped over to it and began to ply the one trade I had I had, which seemed truly unique. The safe popped open with a whimper, and inside was my prize. The party time Bintal recipe. But it wasn't mine. I scavenged. I looted the homes of slavers and raiders. But this was stealing from a poor young earth pony, not yet a mare. But Party time mentals. And really, all I had to do was take it long enough to copy it into my pit buck. I'd put it right back. And that wouldn't be stealing, right? Except, Pinky Bell was offering it as a reward for helping her with something. And that made me feel like I was stealing. Like I was taking a reward I didn't earn. I sat, staring into the safe for I don't know how long. Finally, I focused my levitation magic and picked up one other item in the safe. A recorder with a single imprinted message. I copied it into my pit buck and started it. I didn't recognize the voice, but she sounded young. At least, as young as Pinky Bell was now. Pear Tree. The raiders came back yesterday, but they didn't take kindly to Daddy running them off last week with a shotgun. 
so this time they came in force. Alma made us whole up in the in upstairs bedroom and cast a spell over us, keeping us safe from being seen. She made us pop promise to be quiet. But Silverbell, my little sister, has always been able to make beautiful music. Like to, th like to think of dozens of magical bells. We all adore it. But Silverbell, sometimes when she's frightened or worried, the spell happens all on its own. She didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. The raiders killed Mama and Daddy. They killed them, really slow and brutal. And they made us watch. It was... I buried them out on the end of the east field, put a couple planks as tombstones. I hate that they won't last long, but I can't carve their names into rocks. And Mama and Daddy deserve to have their names over their graves. Silverbell has nightmares every night. Honestly, I do most nights too. And during the days, she just curls up, silent-like, never crying, never smiling. I can't even get her to eat. I don't know what to do. I'm going to try taking her to Ten Pony Tower. I've heard there's a buck up there who takes in orphans. It's a long walk, and so I'm headed up to gather provisions from the neighbors. If I'm not back when you get here, please load up the wagon. I know I can't ask you to come with us. You have your own folks to take care of. But I would really appreciate it if you could hang around so I could at least say goodbye. You're the best buck friend I could have asked for. Love, memory. I sat there, stunned. Oh, sweet goddess Celestia. You shouldn't have listened to that! I turned with a start to see Pinky Bell, no, Silver Bell, staring right into my face. It's not yours! This close, I got a much better look at that scar. Realization hit me like cold water. Silver Bell was a unicorn. She'd cut off her own horn. I recoiled back into the open safe. You want it so much? Keep it! Silverbell reached up to swing the safe closed on me. From behind, Velvet Remedy's voice broke the air. You're not like Pinkie Pie. Silverbell froze, slowly turning away from me. She blocked the front of the safe, and I somehow couldn't bring myself to barge through her to get out. You're nothing like Pinkie Pie. Velvet Remedy spoke slowly, calmly. Her voice wasn't accusing now, but it was mostly sad. You are, if anything, the opposite of Pinkie Pie. I watched the filly in front of me shake. Emotions seemed to rush through her, as if they didn't want to stay or were eager to get out of the way, so the next emotion could take hold. You don't bring happiness. When I look at you, all I feel is sad, Velvet continued her verse giving gentleness to her words. If Pinkie Pie were to meet you, she wouldn't throw a party. Yes, she would! Velvet paused only a moment. Maybe she would, but she wouldn't throw a party because she wanted to have fun with you. She would throw a party because she wanted to help you, because you would make her very sad. Well, what do you, you know? I know that laughter, real laughter, isn't forced. It isn't something you paint on to hide how you are truly feeling. Velvet Remedy walked slowly towards the filly, who was trapped between flying into a rage and breaking down into tears. I know that you are very badly hurt inside. It is not the sort of hurt that can be fixed with a party, or healed by my horn. By the time Velvet Remedy had reached the filly, Silverbell was shaking badly. What happened to your parents wasn't your fault. What happened to your sister wasn't your fault. To her sister? Suddenly, I remembered the three planks in the field. The last one crooked, like it was planted by someone smaller and younger, who 
who didn't manage so well. I thought of an older sister named Memory, trotting out alone, towards the nearest neighbors, another farm probably dozens of miles away, through territory being savaged by raiders. My heart broke. Yes, it was! And with that, Silverbell collapsed into wretched sobs. Velvet Remedy was there to wrap her head and a leg around the filly, giving her a mane to cry on. Footnote. Level up. New perk. Math Wrath. You're able to optimize your Pitbuck's targeting spell logic. Sats is now 20% cooler. 